title, Crafted by Angels. Principle, Scripture teaches the soul and the spirit of man come by God. Elohim. Turn to Genesis, the first chapter, verse 27. his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So Elohim is the creator of man's inner being. Ecclesiastes, the twelfth chapter, verse seven. Yes, he's 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. The man's inner being <coughs> comes about by God. Now, Scripture teaches man's physical body was created by an angel. Exodus, the third chapter, verse 1 to 2. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. That's what it says, the angel of the Lord. <coughs> Turn to Exodus, the fourth chapter, verse 11. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord, so the angel of the Lord takes credit for making man's physical being. Now, some people may say, well, are you sure that's an angel? Turn to Acts, the seventh chapter. verse 35. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge, the same did God, Elohim, send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. The angel takes responsibility for making man's physical makeup.
this was common knowledge to the uh, church in Acts. You read several different parts of Scripture where they refer to it now. <coughs> scripture teaches all of the Old Testament law was designed and delivered by angels. The law was designed, brought into being by angels and delivered by angels. Turn to Acts, the 7th chapter, verse 53. Acts 7, 53. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. <clears throat> the law was given by angels. The law was designed by angels. Turn to Exodus 32. Exodus 32. This 32, I'm going to pick it up in verses 15 and 16. He turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides on one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. God that he's referring to is the angel YHVH Jehovah Yahweh. The law was given written by angels. Scripture teaches all of the Old Testament law, all of it, was designed and delivered by angels, <coughs> and is superseded by the word of Elohim. Matthew, fifth chapter, verse twenty-one. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Who was the them of old time? The angels that gave the law. Okay, wait a minute, something's wrong. I got Matthew 6, no, 21. Matthew 5. 5, okay. Matthew 5, 21, 22. Okay. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Thou should not kill. Whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So Jesus is telling them what you have heard and what you have followed superseded by what I say. Mm -hmm. Drop down to verse 27 to 28. You have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her 
hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now these people understood what Jesus was saying, but they couldn't believe what they were hearing. Drop down to Matthew 7, verse 28 and 29. Matthew 7, 28 to 29. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In other words, they were thinking that what they were following comes from God. Jesus is letting them know that what they have been believing is superseded by the word of God who is talking to them and when they heard this they, they were in a state of shock a state of shock the scripture goes on to tell us the word of angels the old covenant the old testament is superseding by the word of Elohim Hebrews the second chapter verses 1 to 3 they say the New Testament church understood this. They knew the difference. Hebrews 2, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, that at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. He is comparing the word spoken by angels, the word spoken by Elohim. He's saying their word was steadfast. What they said came to pass. But what Elohim says, more so will come to pass. Which brings us to the big controversy of the law. The law versus the kingdom. Jesus says, I have not come to do away with the law, I have come to fulfill it. He did. Since they were created beings, the angels could only administer a limited solution to the problem of man's fallen condition. That limited solution was the law, the statutes, the rituals, the things that were given to man so that he could live in harmony with life and at least receive the blessings of life. But they could not correct the situation. They could not administer a permanent solution. But Elohim could totally meet man's need. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 2 to 4. of the spirit of life in Christ. That's Elohim. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the ritual of commandments, laws, and statutes. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh 
God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit so he's saying that Elohim could bring about a total permanent solution to man's sin problem the angelic guardians of man could not they're limited to what they could do Luther teaches the covenant of Jehovah YHVH and its blessings are also superseded by the covenant of Elohim the new covenant and its blessings Turn over to Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 to 2. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, the Lord thy God shall set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou wilt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. <coughs> so we find <coughs> the old covenant blessings being presented. It is a covenant of works. You have to do something in order to receive something. That's the best that they could offer. It dealt with living to the best that you could and receiving the best that you could of the blessings of the earth and all that is described deals with life on earth having rain in due season uh, uh, having your enemies kept at bay the fruit of your harvest the fruit of your body uh, <clears throat> being uh, blessed when you come in being blessed when you go out it all deals with life on and it's limited to life on earth now turn to Hebrews 11th chapter verse 39 to 40 These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. So he's saying two things here. He's saying that the promises of the old covenant were eternal. Because it goes on to say they didn't receive them in their lifetime. But he's saying the promises of the new covenant are better than the promises of the old covenant and they don't receive their promises until we receive ours so turn over to revelation 21st chapter verses 1 to 3 I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more seen. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride had gone for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. So this is the, the time in which the promises, the eternal promises, come into fulfillment. The new covenant, uh, the old covenant deals with the eternal promises on a new earth. Israel will be the number one nation. Israel will be the leader, the mover and shaker of the new earth. Drop down to verse 23, 24, same chapter. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of the God did shine in it, and the light, Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. The kings of the earth are the old covenant saints, the old covenant greats. That was the promise that they were looking for. That was the promise that they died looking at from a distance they receive it in their life they're going to dominate the new earth turn back to Hebrews 11th chapter verse 8 to 10 Hebrews 11 what? verses 8 to 10 faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. He went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now turn over to Genesis, the 18th chapter. appeared unto him in the plain of memory and he sat in the tent in the door in the heat of the day so he gets a visit from YHVH now drop down to verse 17 and 18 and the Lord said shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. He's talking about the descendants of Abraham ultimately are going to dominate the new earth. That was what he promised Abraham. That's why Abraham was looking for that city. That would be the headquarters city out of which the kings of the earth would come forth and <clears throat> go into the earth and rule the nations that were given to them by the Lord. Their total promise deals with the earth. Now, contrast that to one New Testament or one New Covenant promise. Turn to Ephesians, first chapter, verse 3.
Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, talking about Elohim, who hath blessed us, we, new covenant saints, with all, A-L-L, spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We are to inherit all things from the heavens. The Old Covenant saints are limited to those things of earth. They cannot ascend into heaven. It's not promised to them. They're not heirs of it. They don't have the ability to do it because they didn't have the indwelling spirit. That's why they're waiting. That's why their resurrection doesn't take place until the second coming. After the last of the new covenant saints is resurrected. Then the Old Covenant saints resurrect. resurrect to a millennial of blessings on the earth, which is part, a partial of their promises, but the fullness of their promises come in at the beginning of the establishment of the heavens, new heavens and the new earth. The new covenant saints, a thousand years prior to that, come into the fullness of their blessings. So we see a superiority beyond comprehension in comparison because you're looking at the difference between God and the angels. The angels are given authority over what they produced. Man, uh, the scripture tells us that they uh, were given the responsibility of guiding the human race, protecting it. Um, that's the reason why Israel came to be the nation, so that there would be a visible people in which the rest of the human race could look at and see how life is ordained to be lived. Elohim gave YHVH responsibility after the fall of man to be the guide and the instructor over the human race. <clears throat> when men died in the Old Covenant, they went into the subterranean region and fully into the protection and paradise of the Halloween of uh, YHVH says he is the God of the living, not of the dead. They all live to him. We come directly under Elohim, the Godhead. Angelic protection is given us, yes, but not as a result of the same reason that is given uh, under the Old Covenant. Angelic protection is given to us, directly assigned to us by God. So we have a whole different pattern, a whole different reference, a whole different treasure that we can look at, pursue, and prepare for than they do. The final analysis, again, where we will be is determined by the life we live here. There are levels of the heavens, higher levels, lower levels, depending upon where we progress, that's where we will be. Turn over to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. Second Corinthians, what chapter? 5th chapter, verse 1. But well, we know, state of fact, that if our earthly house, a couple of pages after, about 15, but we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So what's being said here, our inheritance 
when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, all that is already established, is waiting for you. Under the old covenant, they, they never had that. It was never promised to them. When they die, they went into the heart of the earth, and I believe that's where they still are. When we die, we go to our inheritance in the heavens because we are sons of God. They are servants of God. It's a big distinction. The servants' quarters, the scripture tells us earth is God's footstool. The servants' quarters is the servants' quarters. The sons' quarters is in a higher majestic state. John the Baptist understood that. He knew the difference. And uh, he was sad because he realized what he could never have. But he could be content with what he did have. We don't realize what we have, most of us. But those that do, they better pursue it because the door is not going to remain open for much longer. And as we pursue, the scripture tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God, our place, our calling, and advancement into the kingdom. That will determine our place in eternity under the new covenant. Title, Mystery Names. We want to take a look at the names of Jehovah and Elohim. Principle. YHVH, Jehovah, is God's name. Turn to Exodus 6, chapter, verses 2 to 3. God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name and Jehovah was I not known to them. Now this, throughout this lesson, one thing, the overriding thing that has been drilled in my understanding is the, the limitations of the translation from the original language. In this passage of scripture, verse 3, says, I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. The, by the name is not in the original Hebrew. It says, I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah was unknown to them. So the name Jehovah is the name of God all the way up to the Father that's his name Jehovah O Y H V H Yahweh they really don't know how to pronounce it because they don't put in the vowels under the consonants scripture teaches Elohim is not a name. It is a type of being. A God. A God being. Genesis, the first chapter, verse 1. In the beginning... God, Elohim, created heavens and the earth. The being, the highest being, Elion, created the heavens and the earth. It's not talking about his name, it's talking about what he is. It's important for us to understand it's from the original language, the, the, the Hebrew. Principle, scripture teaches the name Yahweh, YHVH, can be conferred to another, giving that being authority. Exodus, the 23rd chapter, verse 20 to 21.
you know, there's send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way, to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Wear of him and obey his voice, provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. So, YGH has transferred his name to another being, conferring authority over <coughs> the Israelites. So we find that the name, whoever carries the name, carries the authority. Scripture indicates the name of God the Father is the Yahweh, Y-H-D-H. -H. Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord. Huh? Yahweh. Said unto my Lord. Word my Lord there is Adonai. Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Here's talking about the name of the Father. Ha Yahweh. The Jehovah, the Yahweh, said to my Lord. Now it's important to realize this because it makes a lot of the things that we read in the scripture more plainer. Scripture teaches all who have the name of Yahweh, Y-H-V-H, are distinguished by their being a lesser intelligence. In other words, whoever carries the name the being that they are is next to the name. Case in point, Genesis, the 16th chapter, verse 7. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain in the way of Shur. Now, that's the English. The original Hebrew. It says, um, Malach Yahweh. The angel Yahweh. The angel Jehovah found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness by the, by the fountain in the way of Shur. So talking about the being that carries the name is identified. Turn to Genesis 22, verse 11. The angel of the Lord called him unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here am I. In Hebrew, if you look at the Hebrew itself, they're not even the Hebrew translations the way they put it. You look at the Hebrew words and it says, The angel Yahweh called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. Now, to show how clear it makes it, when you look at it from that perspective, drop down to verse 15 and 16. So, I'm going to read it from the Hebrew. Uh, rendering and the angel Yahweh called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said by myself have I sworn say saith the Yahweh because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son thine only son that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven is the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So this is talking about Abraham's sacrifice which was initially engineered by the angel Yahweh and the Yahweh, the father, was so impressed that he tells the angel Yahweh to tell Abraham that this is what he's going to confer to him. If you read in the English it makes no sense. 
you read the original Hebrew, it's talking about the name, the person that carries the name is defined by the being that he is. <clears throat> Here's another case in point. Exodus 33, verses 17 to 19. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also, thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness to pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of thee, Yahweh, before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. So it's talking about the angel Yahweh always gives glory to the Father. But you can't tell it by reading the translation. The, the, the thing is really out of sequence when it translated all lo the Lord. If they at least kept it in the original Hebrew name rather than conferring the name Lord it would have been a lot clearer. You wouldn't have a Jehovah's Witness organization because it would be abundantly clear that there's more than one. It's not talking about the Father. The Father, El Yon, <coughs> in the context, it's two things that they speak of, the name and the type of being. Moloch, Yahweh, is always Angel Jehovah. Elohim is basically talking about the type of being, God, a God being. And in many cases, it's referring to, <coughs> he's called Elion, Elohim, the Most High God. that there's no being higher than he is. The Yahweh. Everybody would know he's referring to the Father. And when you read the scripture, when you read it from the Hebrew in pen context, that's what it will give you. But it's not taking it away. I was looking at the way they the way they describe it. The guy that translated it, uh, a strong concordance. It got translated as the name as though it was the same individual. He talks about he revealed his way, his name to Abraham to uh, Moses. He didn't reveal his name to Abraham because Moses was intended to be the deliverer and not Abraham. And I'm looking at him and saying, "How does he come to this stuff? You know, where does he get this stuff from?" The the idea deals totally with conferring authority onto lesser beings. Now, what we find is interesting. Scripture indicates the angel Jehovah, the angel Yahweh, received the name Yahweh when he was given authority over the lower creation. The name Yahweh, Jehovah, was added to his being in Elohim. <coughs> 